Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this roundtable on sustaining the uh, outer space environment. Um, my name is Juliet Dryden, and I'm the director of BISA. Um, we, um, we put on virtual events every week at BISA for our members, um, but actually I'm delighted to say that this one is we've opened up to non-members. Um, so I thought it might be a good opportunity uh, to uh, just spend a minute or two explaining what BISA does um, for those of you who might not be familiar with us. Um, so BISA is the British International Studies Association. Uh, we're a charitable, learned uh, society. We're a, a membership association uh, and we're devoted to the promotion um, and development of international studies, international relations in the UK. Um, we we're really, we're committed to furthering research, knowledge exchange, professional development, learning and teaching, all of those things. Um, and just very briefly, just, just because I know a lot of you don't know us, we have 29 uh, research groups specializing in all aspects of um, international relations, all sorts of things from uh, global nuclear order, ethics and world politics, international political economy, gendering IR, foreign policy, and so on. We also have our own publications. So we have two very well uh, known uh, in the field, very well known journals. One is the Review of International Studies and the other one is the European Journal of International Studies. We also have a book series and they're all published by uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, we also provide many funding opportunities. Last year, we, um, I think we gave almost 150,000 um, pounds in grants away. Um, and we also provide lots of networking opportunities between academics, but also between academics and policymakers. Um, so if you're interested, you can find lots more information about all these things on our website. Um, and that also explains how uh, you can, um, how you can access all these benefits by, by joining our association. We have lots of um, great discounts for students and early career researchers and people like that. Um, and of course, you can also contact me or Chrissy or, or any of us at BISA directly. Um, so I think um, without further ado, I would just like to welcome you all, uh, particularly our chair um, and our panelists today. Um, perhaps I'll just introduce you all and you can all just say hi so everybody knows who you are um, or put your hand up or something. Um, uh, we've got... Um, Bledon Bowen from the University of Le Leicester, who will chair this roundtable today. Uh, Bledon, do you want to just say hi so everybody knows Hello, who you are? Oh, this is me. There you are, there you are, welcome. Um, and, uh, sorry, who else have we got? So we've got Scott Steele and, um, well, Scott, sorry, Scott is from the Open University. Scott, where are you? That's great. Oh, there you are, brilliant. We've also got Thomas Cheney, um, who's also from the Open University. Hello. Oh, there he is. Hi, Thomas. Um, Lauren Napier from Northumbria University. Hi. Hi, Lauren. Hi. And also Mert Evergen from Northumbria University. <coughs> hi. Hello. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, and also, I'd like to welcome Harriet Brettel from Astroscale, which is an international space technology company. Hi, hi Harriet. Hi. 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 Great, well, welcome to all of you um, and welcome to all those of you who've registered to, to listen to this. Right, uh, thanks very much. Um, I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, to, to Beza for uh, organising this and then putting on uh, this uh, virtual round, round table. Uh, of course, it's a big shame that uh, the annual conference uh, had to be uh, cancelled, but uh, thanks very much for putting this on and, and uh, allowing us to do what we can with the situation we're in. Um, so, uh, as you've just been told, uh, I'm Blethyn Bowen. Um, I'm a lecturer in international relations at the University of Leicester, and I specialise in space warfare, military space activities, and uh, geopolitics and international relations uh, applied to 
uh, outer space. Um, and I'll, I'll briefly um, uh, mention the order that we're going to go in uh, for the uh, panel today. Um, uh, just after uh, I sort of briefly talk about why space is important and um, as, as an international relations, space is very much quite a neglected um, uh, geopolitical or geostrategic environment. Um, it's, it's very lonely in space um, and that is very true in the international relations of space and, and the study of IR in space. Uh, co contrary to um, the, the legion of experts on various things that happen, even just in strategic studies on land warfare, naval warfare, aerial warfare, now of course cyber warfare, the space is very neglected comparatively speaking and the same is true for people who look at various infrastructures that are being built around the world as well and space infrastructure or orbital infrastructure is definitely a very neglected part of studying uh, the international um, in space. And, um, and space is, is essential really today for a lot of, for pretty much everything we do in the high tech economy, uh, high tech uh, politics and um, military capabilities as well. Um, so space has become quite an ubiquitous infrastructure for us all uh, from uh, mundane everyday stuff to the more spectacular uh, stunts uh, in, in orbit in the International Space Station or even further afield of planetary and interplanetary uh, exploration. So space is a very big place where lots of things Go, uh, are happening. Um, so we're, we're going to be focusing on very specific aspects today based on the expertise uh, of um, the, the very illustrious panel that we have for you today. Um, so um, the uh, backgrounds of our scholars today is a bit of a mix. It's not a, sort of a strict IR background. Um, so first up we'll have um, Myrta Virgen, um, who is uh, of course a PhD researcher at Northumbria University, um, and he looks at um, space law games um, and uh, conducts space law games I should say and, and the issues of litigation and the legal vacuums of liability in space so when countries start blaming each other things that go wrong in space um, immerse the person who's going to sort it all out. Um, we, uh, then we'll have um, Harry Brettel from Astroscale um, and, and Harriet is going to be able to give us um, uh, very much an economics and business perspective of what's going on in space. And commercial uh, space activity is definitely uh, increasing and has done uh, fairly consistently for the past 30 years. So the uh, business and non-state actor um, input is, of course, very, very important. Uh, then we'll have uh, Lauren Napier, um, who should also uh, thank specifically for uh, putting together uh, this uh, panel, for assembling us all. So thanks especially to Lauren there. But Lauren is, is a PhD researcher again at Northumbria University um, and, and uh, Lauren specializes on low earth orbit in particular and is doing her PhD on a mix of IR and international law uh, backgrounds. Um, and uh, then we have uh, Tom Shaney, um, who is, uh, of course, a lecturer in space governance at Astrobiology at the Open University. Um, and um, he looks at um, uh, planetary protection, environmental aspects of international space governance, um, space resources um, and property rights in space. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Scott Steele, uh, who's doing a PhD at the Univ Open University and again is looking at space governance beyond Earth orbit um, and, and uh, planetary protection as well. Uh, so uh, with enough introductions, I will now um, hand over to Mert and I will be timing you for around 10 minutes and I'll give you about two minutes warning um, for you to start wrapping up uh, so that we can get into the questions um, afterwards. So. Um, when you're ready, Mert, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'd like to start by saying that I hope you're all well and safe during these difficult times. Um, but yes, aside from that, uh, sort of an overview into space law and liability within space. Um, I'd like to share with you all two ideas to help contextualize uh, space law. The first one is that space law wasn't designed to be purely law, which, may sound, which might sound strange, but it's actually a byproduct of the Cold War. It's more of a, a peacekeeping treaty between wars between the USA and the USSR. And as we know now, space is no longer just the USA and USSR. It's at, at you know many commercial entities ranging from personalities such as Musk to um, ESA, the European Space Agency. So it's um, it's a it's a wide and very varied field now. But it wasn't designed for commercial actors. It was designed for two superpowers and to essentially not turn it into a second Cuba. The sec and that's going to be the first part of my presentation. The second idea I'd like you all to mull over while we're going through it is 
I'd like you to imagine the complexity of solving a road traffic accident. I hope you know, none of you have ever been in one, but the sort of litigation that goes into it, the forensics, the evidence gathering, even something that happens on earth, the how long it takes, how difficult it, it can be. I'll get back to that point though, when we get to the second part, which is the liability part. So just to kick it off, what is space law described as officially? The United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs unsurprisingly describes it as the body of law governing space-related activities, most often associated with the rules, principles, and standards of international law. So we have five treaties, which, are, which is the international law branch, and the, five, and the first treaty, which is the Outer Space Treaty, um, which I'll get on to in a moment, encourages nation states to develop their own national law. For example, the UK has two statutes, the Outer Space Act and the Space Industry Act. And then there's also the hard versus soft law debate within space law. And not, without going too much into it, the difference between hard and soft law is hard law is laws like sort of national law and international treaties where it's sort of set guidelines, whereas soft law is, uh, well, actually soft law is more like the space debris mitigation guidelines, where it's a set of rules that aren't um, enforced, but they're recommended. And through practice, they start to have more of an impact. But I mean, uh, Lauren and my other colleagues will probably describe those areas more. So, so dwelling into the five international treaties, it starts with the Outer Space Treaty, which was fi like finalized and ratified in 1967. Um, it sets out really the foundations for the rest of the, the subsequent four treaties to follow. It had rules such as space is the sovereign of mankind, it belongs to all, and that n no one can lay sovereign claim that it must be used for peaceful and scientific research purposes, um, that there's prohibition towards the placement of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction in space, and limits the use of the moon and other celestial bodies for uh, sort of purely militaristic activities. This doesn't mean that militaries aren't allowed to be involved in space, they are more than most commercial sectors, but it's, like I said earlier, not creating a second Cuba, that was the aim. Aside from that, the, international, the Outer Space Treaty also lays uh, the groundworks for astronauts being the envoys of mankind and that there should be no harmful contamination of space. And sort of quite important for the uh, whole liability spectrum of it, that a nation has to take responsibility for its actions in space. The Rescue Agreement, the second treaty, a year after the Outer Space Treaty, sort of extends the astronauts are envoys of mankind. It's, but then again, this also emphasized the Cold War branch of development of the whole Outer Space Treaties because all the Rescue Agreement really emphasizes is that if a satellite or a spacecraft or an astronaut crashes in, in another territory or somewhere, the other nations must do everything they can to re rescue and return immediately. This is essentially if the USSR or the USA dropped something to his land, they didn't want them prodding around in it. It was based, that was the basis for it. The Liability Convention is the third Outer Space Treaty, which I will leave for the liability section, you know, hence the name. The Registration Convention, the fourth one, was the final internationally accepted treaty. It's essentially, it requires states to send, uh, furnish the United Nations with details about the orbit of each of their objects, just so they can be a catalog and everyone could know where's what. Um, the last and odd one out is the Moon Treaty, which while it has been ratified about five years after it was initially proposed, it, none of the major space faring nations have signed up to it. And this is really where international treaties stop becoming a part of space law or stop being used in space law because um, no, none of the nations could agree and wanted to be held back by the provisions of the Moon Treaty. One well, of the main disagreements was over the fact the calling the Moon and uh, things like asteroids or celestial bodies common heritage of mankind, which meant that people frankly had to share. And understandably, this, uh, most nation states unsurprisingly didn't want to share those that. So while there's been ratifications to the Moon Treaty, they don't, it doesn't have the same impact as the other, the previous four, and is just simply not ex accepted. Now I'd like to move on to the second part, which is liability in outer space. Um, this is where I mentioned the whole, um, I want you all to think about the road traffic accident scenario. Now I'd like you to imagine these extra sections 
all these ideas, think that you have to observe this accident, but it's happening in London and you're in Edinburgh. And gravity, as you know, it doesn't really work there. There's bits of metal flying around at 17,000 miles per hour that could wipe anything out. And half the time, you don't know who the car or belongs to or who the person is. Or if you do, how do you prove it? So this is really the complexity of establishing liability in outer space. It's not just that the law isn't, um, it's not just that the law is vague, but it's also that the environment is so difficult to ascertain that you're suddenly, not only are your tools not great, but the, <laughs> the resource you have is very difficult to mold as well. Essentially, liability in outer space is developed from the first outer space treaty with the three articles, articles six, seven, and eight. Article six, um, established state responsibility, that any, anything that launches from a state, they are suddenly responsible for that object or that state actor, for example, a commercial company, if it launches from the US, the US is responsible for that. Uh, Article 7, it um, enables liability through jurisdi the jurisdiction of territory. And Article 8 is jurisdi jurisdiction through registry of object. So if you launch something that is your, under your, your jurisdiction because you've registered it, it's yours, that's your liability. The Liability Convention develops on, develops on these three articles. And I'd, I'd like to specifically draw your attention to two articles I'm going to mention. Article 2, which is for what I like to call on Earth and, um, or aircraft damage. And Article 3, which is in space damage. Now, Article 2 is a case of absolute liability, which means that if it's done, it's your fault. If it, I mean, like, let's say your rocket crashes into a plane, your satellite hits. Um, land that suddenly that's absolutely your fault if it's proven that it's you Whereas the a third article which is fault-based liability is f and, and damage to space is the basis of if something happens in space you have to prove fault to be able to have that liability and like i mentioned to you a moment ago the proving fault is not is no easy matter so you can i'm, I'm guessing we can all start to see where the flaws in space law or the what's lacking is now starting to show and become apparent. There are two examples or commonly used examples within space law of Article 2 and Article 3. Um, there's the on Earth example, Article 2, which was Cosmos 954. It was a, a USSR satellite that had a nuclear reactor malfunction. It crashed over um, the tundras of Canada and it spilt nuclear waste. Um, Canada spent $18 million. The US spent $5 million on a cleanup and retrieval mission. That I think, I believe they approximately recovered 1% of the nuclear waste, but the, and the Liability Convention was enacted and the USSR paid Canada about $3 million, which might seem unfair or lacking, but I think the Article 3 example will make you realize that that's not as bad as it could be. Um, in 2009, there was a collision between Iridium-33 and Cosmos-2251. And Iridium, an active US satellite, and Cosmos, an inactive Russian military satellite, collided. And even though they were stated to be very low uh, probability of collision, they caused the second and fourth biggest debris event in recorded space history. So, and once this collision happened, there was, there was nothing that could be done. Uh, or, well, the, the Liability Convention was enacted, and there was nothing done between the two companies or the two entities to try and create a solution so it's a 10 minutes mate right okay well thank you very much that was the end anyway <laughs> oh, excellent well thanks very much for keeping to the time um i, I guess just a, a, a quick comment there especially for um uh, audiences who may not be uh, space experts i guess um a, a lot of that is is under current a lot of current debate in the space community as space traffic management um and um when you think about all that stuff flying around in space you know there are over 2,000 active satellites in space and that's only going to increase by hundreds and hundreds more if uh, the company SpaceX continues to put on a mega constellation uh, which could be thousands of satellites uh, by itself so uh, for anyone to look into more detail space traffic management is a useful concept to bring this together how do you manage all these satellites and bits of junk that are flying around in, in diff different orbits uh, th thanks very much uh, for that uh, Mert uh, and next uh, we have uh, Harriet uh, if I'm not mistaken 
All right, thank you very much. So, Ben, I think that was a, a perfect segue into what, what I'm going to talk about today, um, which is what I really want to focus on is, you know, how can we support sustainability in space? So what does that mean? Um, and, and why should we care about sustainability when it comes to the space environment? Uh, so there's three key takeaways that I, I, I hope folks can, can get from, from my short talk here. The first is I want to really re-emphasize that we rely on satellites in everyday life. So uh, space is often thought about as this, you know, far away place where, you know, magical cosmical uh, events take place. Um, but it, the, the effects and the impacts of, of space activities have really valid, tangible uh, benefits to, to life on Earth. The second is space is getting crowded. So Bledin just uh, was highlighting the, the, the growth in the number of satellites that we have uh, orbiting the Earth, but also the, the growing amount of, of space debris. Uh, I'm going to touch on that a little bit as well. And the third point is that we really need to act now to ensure future space sustainability. So diving into each of those in a little bit more detail, uh, society depends on satellite technology for a whole range of aspects in our everyday life, whether it is weather forecasting, uh, disaster management, telecommunications, uh, enabling timestamps to facilitate financial services transactions, navigation through things like GPS, uh, we're using satellite technology on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and the information that we receive from these tech, um, satellites and the downstream services that, that we rely on uh, will only become more important in the future as we move towards an ever-increasingly connected world. Uh, so that, that kind of reliance on satellite capability and, and technology means that, that satellites uh, and the services they provide become a critical infrastructure um, for, for kind of downstream services that, that we rely on. So moving on to the concept of, of space getting crowded. Again, we think of space as being very big um, uh, and, and there being a lot of space. Uh, pun not intended. Um, but as Bledin highlighted, there's you know currently about 2,000 satellites operating um, in orbit around the Earth right now. Um, and while space is big, the, the usable space that we rely on for this, these satellites to provide their services is somewhat finite. So the regions of space that we, we use for, for satellites uh, can be broadly split into two core areas. So what we call low Earth orbit, so that's anywhere from about 300 100 kilometers above your head to about 1500 kilometers up um, and a geostationary orbit so or geo which is 35,000 kilometers away from the earth and it's at that distance where a satellite takes a full 24 hours to orbit the earth so that means if you're standing um, on the ground looking up at the sky that satellite will stay in a fixed position and that's really useful to be able to provide global coverage and have a fixed line of sight between the ground and the satellite. Um, and so we've got, as I mentioned, about 2,000 operational satellites in orbit right now. Um, but we're looking to, or the, the commercial satellite industry in particular, is looking to dramatically increase the number of satellites in orbit. Uh, and this is particularly being driven by the growth of so-called satellite constellations that are looking at providing uh, both Earth observation services, so being able to uh, monitor changes on the Earth, um, and also telecommunication services, so being able to provide uh, global internet coverage um, across the world in, in a faster way than we've been able to do previously. Um, so whilst we have about 2,000 satellites in orbit right now, we're looking at tens of thousands of satellites being launched into orbit over the next kind of 10 years, which really re uh, you know, results in a dramatic increase in the amount of activity that we have in space. Um, and as in, in addition to all of these active satellites, we also have a growing amount of space debris or space junk. Um, and this can be anything from a very small fleck of paint that chips off the International Space Station, all the way up to a, an eight ton bus size satellite that has failed and is stuck in orbit. Um, space debris can stay, remain in space uh, for tens to thousands of years because as you reach these higher altitudes, uh, there's no longer an atmosphere to drag things down uh, and, and the space debris can, can stay in orbit for, a, for an almost indefinite period of time. Which really poses a, a big challenge for the space industry as we keep launching things into orbit, the amount of debris continues to increase. Um, we know at the moment that 
the, uh, the US Space Surveillance Network is tracking over 20,000 debris objects. So if we think about that compared to the number of operational satellites, right, over 95% of artificial objects in space are in fact debris. Um, and that's just the things we know about. There's also a uh, significantly more uh, uh, number of pieces of debris that are smaller than 10 centimeters, which is the kind of limit of what we can track right now. Um, and that poses a real problem because you might think, okay, well, what, what damage can a, you know, a, a coin sized piece of debris cause in space? But as, as Mert highlighted, the, the speeds that things are traveling at, in orbit mean even uh, a piece of debris the size of a 10p coin can cause catastrophic damage to a satellite. And so that means the space debris is posing a threat to future sustainability, both to the entire orbital environment, but it's also posing a direct risk to those individual operators that are providing those services. So I think what's important is for us to consider the space environment like any other environment. You know, this, uh, this debris, this pollution problem is not a new concept, right? You know, we, we see uh, pollution of plastics in the oceans or pollution uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, you know, this is very much an environmental problem where we see a lot of different actors contributing to the problem. Um, but they're somewhat hesitant for anyone to take individual responsibility to, to address this. Right. Um, and so kind of putting my industry hat on, that's where Astroscale as a commercial company comes in. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, basically addressing this orbital debris problem through a kind of three pronged approach. So this is looking at the uh, debris environment and considering how we can build technology that can actively do something about it. How can we develop and support international policy to move the space, space ecosystem into a more uh, sustainable future? Um, and how can we develop a commercial business that can create the right incentives for satellite operators to act sustainably? So just quickly diving into each of those in a little bit more detail. Um, Mert highlighted quite nicely, you know, this, this traffic problem that we have in space, right? Um, and, and it poses a big challenge in terms of how do we actually address the amount of space debris um, that we have in, in orbit right now. Um, so there's a number of different technologies that are looking at, at addressing this problem. Uh, Astroscale is launching an in-orbit demonstration later this year called LCD, and the idea is to be able to demonstrate the end-to-end -end technology capabilities that are required to launch a spacecraft into orbit, rendezvous and capture a piece of debris, and then safely bring it down to a low altitude where the Earth's atmosphere does the heavy lifting and things burn up safely uh, in the atmosphere. You've got so around two minutes left. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the technology piece. Um, on the policy and, and regulation side, I think this is where we'll probably get into the meat of this in this panel today. Um, but what's really important is having that international collaboration on this pro approach. You know, this isn't something that one company or one nation is going to be able to solve alone. And so we really need to work together to develop norms, regulations and practices that can ensure us to uh, move towards that, that, that sustainable future. That we're looking for. Um, and then finally on the business side, uh, what, what we're looking for essentially is ways that we can develop space sweeping services uh, in space. So going back to uh, Mert's uh, traffic analogy, which I quite like, um, you know, Astroscale is effectively looking at being the car breakdown provider in space, you know. So when your car breaks down, you call up the AA, and when your satellite breaks down, you call up Astroscale, and we can go clean it up. So obviously that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but the idea is, you know, we're looking to develop those uh, commercial incentives uh, to make sure that satellite operators are thinking about sustainability from the get go. Um, and this isn't a, you know, it's no longer an afterthought that people worry about at the end of life, but it's integrated into the design, operation um, and responsible end of life um, of those satellites. Um, and with that, I will um, pass on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Harriet. Um, right, um, moving swiftly on then to uh, Lauren. Hi. Uh, thank you again, Visa, for having us, and thanks to my panel and my chair for willing to work with me today. Um, so I'm going to pick up a little bit where Harriet and Mert left off, except I'm going to look at it more from the IR perspective, as that's my background. 
Um, so we mentioned why LEO or low Earth orbit is important, uh, but I'd like to also touch on the fact that, especially in the situation we're in right now, satellites in low Earth orbit are doing a lot for Earth observation in terms of disaster management. Now that's very critical from where I'm from in Florida, where we are, you know, tracking and managing hurricanes, but it also can help in things like the pandemic that we're in now, things like de deforestation, and it can also help getting medicine to the right people when they need it at the right time. So it's very critical that low Earth orbit is able to stay functioning, which is why we look at it from what we call the three S perspective, security, safety, and sustainability. Um, security is a little bit more about how we can make sure that low Earth orbit stays weapon free or that the military presence there is doing something in a little more passive way. Whereas the safety aspect is like what Mert and Herod were just discussing with our car crash analogy that we want to make sure that our satellites aren't colliding and creating more debris because at this stage low Earth orbit is also home to the International Space Station. So we do have humans in this orbit and it's very critical that we make sure that they are able to stay safe and continue doing their incredible research. The last one is a newer perspective for us in the space community, it's sustainability. And that's kind of drawing in connection along with why we use low earth orbit to begin with. It's a connector back to that sustainable development and the sustainable development goals. So using um, space enabled applications from small satellites in LEO, we're able to help meet the needs uh, that are there present in the sustainable development goals as well as trying to consider space and Leo itself as a unique environment and we need to keep it sustainable. And the reason I mention this is with all the debris that they mentioned to you before, if we continue to increase the debris, what we use um, as the Kessler syndrome, meaning that it can exponentially increase, then we will have an issue where low earth orbit will no longer be sustainable and it will be a non-renewable resource. It will be a finite resource that will need to be handled differently. Whereas if we are able to use these ways of doing active debris removal and you know, making better regulations and, and operational guidelines at the national and commercial level to make sure that satellites are taking these things into consideration, which is what Mert was speaking about with our space debris mitigation guidelines, we can see that then low earth orbit can stay um, a f like a, a re renewable resource. We can, we can make sure that we're able to do this where it can continue for the long term and for future generations because in low earth orbit, most satellites do not stay very long. So they are able to disintegrate and burn up upon reentry. Therefore, we can keep replenishing the space that we need. No pun intended there either, but um, there, there are other variables that are of issue in low earth orbit, one being radio frequencies. I know everybody's very excited about 5G. 5G is giving us a lot of issues because of radio frequency. Uh, at, one of our, at the UN level, we have the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which handles a lot of details, but also there's the International Telecommunications Union, and they are the ones that process the registration for having radio frequencies. And in GEO, it's kind of like having a parking slot. You're able to put your big telecom sat in a parking spot with a specific frequency and you're fine. But in low Earth orbit, because these satellites come and go so frequently, because they don't stay in orbit very long, we have um, a different way of handling the radio frequency. And actually this is going to start to change with the rise of these mega constellations, as you might've heard of from, from SpaceX, where the Starlink, where they wanna have a lot of satellites working together in unison of the fact on the hundreds or thousands scale. And they're all going to need radio frequency allotments to be able to work together and work in, in orbit. And so now the, the, the issue is on the political side that we want to make sure that we're building regulation that isn't going to, you know, I guess, uh, lock commercial or state interest, but at the same time, keep that safety and that, and that security um, you know, working in low Earth orbit. So this is kind of the, the delicate balance between how do we expand our science and technology and our use of low Earth orbit with also maintaining the three S's. Um, I'd also like to mention that with, unfortunately, with the decision to collect debris, we have um, and the uh, active debris removal on orbit servicing and what they call rendezvous proximity operations, which if any of you know from Apollo, that was basically how they, they prepared to go to the moon by docking together and realigning 
um, the, the spacecraft so that they would be able to then land. So these are the kinds of things we like to do to connect to satellites in order to make them go from inactive to active or to service them almost like in a surgery situation or to clean up the debris. However, from an international relations perspective, we're very wary because quite frankly, you could have the idea that if it's a company from the United States or it's a US initiative, Russia and China might get very nervous about why they're getting so close to their satellite. Are they going to steal their, their technology? Are they gonna steal their data? Are they gonna to try to, to hurt or harm their satellite? Because once you've put something up for a rendezvous or a, um, an operation in space, satellite to satellite, you have to be very careful that you're not getting too close to another country's satellites. The problem is we don't know what too close is to consider harmful interference. And we don't understand that yet because it hasn't really been put into the legal side as so much as being discussed on the political side. So these are some things coming up um, in the future that we're trying to work through how to do, how to keep the state sustainable like Herod was talking about and having these great initiatives without ruffling the feathers of specific uh, states and other actors by getting too close to, to their technology uh, in, the, in the orbit. Another reason why low earth orbit is so critical now is it's not just commercial and states. We also have academic institutions going and this is a great way for what we call developing and emerging space nations to come into space for the first time they are able to put up a small CubeSat or a small small satellite, which you know could be as small as something as a, as a computer actually. And they are able to do that so that they can test how the process works, how to procure the launch, how they get into space, what kind of um, scientific data they can collect while they're in space. And a lot of these are earth observation or military um, firsts for them. So, Keeping LEO open is also a good way to encourage these developing and emerging nations to enter into space and start to learn from the capacity building that you can find through learning about um, these data aspects through science and technology and the transfer of the data from space to, to Earth issues. The, the other thing that I will touch upon is that we now are in an epoch where we're focusing more on what Merck called soft law. So these are non-binding legal instruments. And the reason that we're doing that is it takes a very long time for treaties to come to order. We have over a hundred uh, states, member states at the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. So you can just imagine how hard it is to decide what takeout you want between your family, let alone having to decide what to write in a legally binding document that all nations need to hold together. I can we have tell about you that, two minutes left. Okay, I can tell you that what's really um, great for us now is we've just got the long-term sustainability guidelines, which are non-binding soft law, and it took 10 years to put them together. And so this is the new way forward. While they're not legally binding, because everybody's coming together and trying to agree on something, it's more flexible, it, it moves with the technology and the science, and it gives the, the nations their kind of ability to work in with their national policy and regulation a bit better. So this approach is actually part of the governance and the, um, the new evolutionary aspect of the outer space regime, where we're trying to create guidelines that will be encouraged to be used, but can stay flexible so that not, we're not constantly in the treaty making process. So I just wanted to mention that uh, the outer space regime is evolving, much like the trade regime did and the climate change regime have as well. And this is brand new uh, academic area of research for us. So as the years progress, this and what my next colleagues will talk about is the forefront for space and the challenges that we see in the international studies, be it uh, international relations or international law. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Um, very impressed so far with the timekeeping skills of all the panellists. Let's uh, try and keep this winning streak uh, going. Uh, so uh, I believe, uh, Thomas, you're next. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to basically be picking up on this theme that space isn't as big as we think it is. Um, and I will be looking at sort of two aspects of that. One is sort of resource or, you know, the ability to actually utilise uh, the moon and other celestial bodies, um, but also looking at the the sustainability of the environment itself and why that's important. 
Um, so picking up on this idea that space isn't as big as we think it is, essentially for say the moon, the issue with that is that everybody basically wants to go to the same place. Um, so while the moon itself is huge, um, you know, when, when you're thinking about, right, I want to build a moon base, whether that be NASA, the European Space Agency, or China, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at, well, we need, it needs to be an accessible location, and that's, you know, I'm not going to go into details of orbital dynamics and, and how that calculation works, but, you know, there, there are parts of the moon that are easier to get to than other bits of the moon. Um, that's why all the Apollo sites have sort of clustered. Um, you've got other considerations, like you want ample amounts of sunlight. Uh, and then you want water ice so that you can mine this water ice uh, to provide the, the necessary materials that you need in order to be able to sustain this base without having to continually bring everything up from Earth. Uh, and that really sort of narrows down the actual locations that you can consider building a base. When you get competing uh, groups of people saying, all right, we want to build a moon base, we want to build a moon base, you're like, well, there's maybe like 18 locations that we can all go to and some of them are clearly better than the other ones. Um, and so you need to come up with some mechanism that's a bit more than uh, who can get there first and grab what they can get uh, to organize that situation. Um, and so that's one concern. You also see it with sort of, again, you know, asteroids, there are loads of asteroids, but the, the asteroids that are actually economically viable uh, to consider mining um, are, can be, could be quite few in number. And again, it's where they are, how easily they are to get to, what sort of, how much material they've got. Um, and so it's, it's more about coordinating sort of access and use uh, than, than worrying about the extent of the resources themselves. Then as far as the environment is concerned, uh, we need to think about uh, you know, how and who is using things. Now, this depends on what celestial body we're talking about. So the space treaties uh, don't make any distinction between types of celestial body. So as far as space law is concerned, at least according to the letter of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, the Moon, Mars, and Europa are all the same thing. However, you know, in reality, that's not the case. Um, so one of the articles of the Outer Space Treaty says that we're supposed to avoid harmful contamination of uh, celestial bodies. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't go into a huge amount of details to what constitutes harmful contamination, and lots of lawyers like myself will, can spend plenty of time arguing as to what that means. Broadly speaking, it has been interpreted to mean avoiding the introduction of uh, biological matter. Um, but you know, there are plenty of people who argue that it's, it, it can be a broader environmental consideration. But harmful contamination on the moon might look different from harmful contamination on Mars. And there's a, there's a simple reason for that. Mars has an atmosphere. So if I introduce a harmful contaminant to a, a section of the moon, it's probably going to stay there. Um, that's one of the nice things about the lunar environment. That's one of the reasons why scientists are interested in the lunar environment is it's, it's pretty stable, um, you know, on the order of millions of years. Whereas Mars has an atmosphere and it has winds. And so if you release some sort of bug, either intentionally or by accident, onto the Martian surface, it can move. Um, now, why is that important? Beyond any sort of ethical question of, you know, do we have the right to be introducing terrestrial organisms into celestial bodies? One of the big interests that scientists have uh, in terms of going into outer space is to understand whether there's any life uh, anywhere else in the universe beyond Earth. Um, you know, what's, how did life originate? Um, and if we start accidentally or intentionally introducing terrestrial life uh, to other celestial bodies or contaminants, then you sort of ruin that science experiment um, because we won't know if we find life on Mars is it because it originally it grew there or is it because we accidentally introduced it? Um, and that's why we have the Coast Bar Planetary Protection Guidelines. Um, but it's again, as a theme that is developing out of this, these are soft law guidelines. They are non-binding. They are respected by the scientific community, um, but the uh, commercial entities are less keen on them because they see them as yet more red tape uh, that is holding back their interests. Um, particularly as certain of the commercial entities who are expressing interests are talking about colonization. Um, and so again, it's, it's another sort of thing of like, we haven't developed uh, much of a governance regime dealing with activities beyond Earth orbit. Um, but we are now in a point in which people are seriously talking about activities uh, beyond Earth orbit. 
Uh, and we need to start considering, right, well, what, what are the rule sets that we're going to take with us? We've got a great foundational set of principles in the Outer Space Treaty uh, that, as, as Merit highlighted, you know, these provide some rules, but they're designed essentially for activities in Earth orbit. Um, and there are a whole bunch of, bunch of questions that we're now starting to open up as to, you know, how do they work in space? How, how do we deal with, right, you want this space, I want this space. We've, we've slightly dealt, uh, dealt with them before in terms of the geostationary orbit because, you, you know, there are specific slots and you can only oper operate in one slot at one time. So we've had to come up with a regime. Um, we probably don't need something that comprehensive for the use of the moon or Mars, um, but it is something to consider. Um, and as we've seen in the last two weeks, uh, you know, the U.S. has now issued two uh, policy uh, announcements within the, the last month on, on lunar issues. First, you had Trump's executive order uh, sort of reaffirming the U.S. position that space resources are something the U.S. citizens can take a retainership of. Um, but last night we had the uh, an announcement that, that apparently the U.S. government has been working on what they're calling the Artemis Accords, um, which are, will be some sort of agreement uh, to regulate uh, resource usage uh, on the moon. Now, we don't really know any details about them, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. Um, but A, you can see that there is genuine interest here. Um, but it also clarifies that you know, there's going to be a bro there's broader concerns. Because even if these, these, these accords turn out to be the, the best form of the argument, uh, the fact that they're coming from President Trump and the fact that they're coming from the United States is going to see a reaction. Uh, we already see a reaction uh, by the Russians every time the Americans talk about space resources. And I think a lot of the, that argument is just because it's the Americans making these claims. Um, you also need to consider that, you know, to use a pun, space doesn't operate in a vacuum. Um, whatever Trump proposes uh, for the Artemis Accords will need to, you know, will have effect with U.S. diplomatic relationships. Normally, I mean, given what, everything that's going on with the Iran deal, how receptive is the European community going to be to anything the United States is going to propose? We also need to consider that we're having similar sorts of discussions about resource usage in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, in the high seas. Uh, and how much are we going to see a tit for tat uh, sort of squabbling over? Well, if you want to do this on the moon, we're going to do this here. Uh, one of the things I would be concerned about, for example, is if the United States do go ahead with the Artemis Accords, especially if they do seek to uh, keep the Russians out of the mix, uh, could we see the Russians create their own set of uh, like-minded countries talking about the Arctic? Um, at the moment, the Russians are, are perfectly happy with the, uh, the Law of the Sea Convention process. But if they feel thwarted, especially if they feel that the Americans are getting away with something in outer space, they might change their mind. Um, You're just so less than two minutes. In isolation. Um, fortunately, I don't think any of these things are, these problems are insurmountable. Um, we, can, we can look at analogous regimes or historical examples and see we are able to find models that work. I mean, Antarctica, the Antarctic Treaty is perhaps my favorite. Um, it's, it is a cooperative regime that, that enables an awful lot of science to get done. There's about 5,000 people that live in Antarctica in the summer, uh, and they, they get on reasonably well. It's an imperfect regime, but it's a good one to look at. Um, but these, these sort of program, problems won't magically solve themselves. Um, and so while it might seem slightly absurd that, oh, is it a bit early to be talking about moon mining? Um, it's going to take, as Lauren indicated, it takes a while to get these things done. So it's probably a good idea that we're starting now. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Tom. And uh, right, let's move on to uh, Scott. Thank you very much for that. Um, as Thomas really just said um, and touched upon the um, space governance, space governance is obviously soft law. So there's not really much in it. Um, there is much in space science, there's much in space technology, there's international relations. Now, my project at the moment, and for many, is space governance and what space governance could actually look like. Now, we already have the, the foundations of international law. We can say that in the UN doc, um, declaration. So we have um, cooperation, multilateral cooperation. Uh, we have space law, which is, as Mert said, and obviously my colleagues have discussed, very old um, and as, as something of the, uh, the Cold War. Now, space governance is 
really bringing science, bringing technology, bringing international relations, bringing everything together to discuss where we go. Now, as, as, as Thomas just said, mo the moon, near, near Earth objects and so forth, I go beyond that. I look at the icy moons and I also look at Mars and also beyond that to, to various different planets, moons, etc. Now, how I, how I like really to look at the foundations of space governance is to already see what we already have. Now, if we look at maritime law, if we look at environmental law, if we look at various different laws around the international spectrum, to put them together, to find that foundation so that science, technology, geopolitics, politics um, can all come together, including private industry, to actually come up with a governance regime that may not be legally binding or in the form of a treaty, but eventually over time that will grow into something that's recognised. Which brings nicely on to COSPA, which is about the, the Committee of Space Research. COSPA is accepted, as, as Thomas rightly said, by the science community and some um, politics. But again, it's not legally binding. No one has to follow that. COSPA is um, linked very well, is linked to the science and obviously planetary protection. But again, planetary protection is not legally binding. Although recognised by science, we now have the extreme that private entities now can enter space and really do what they want. Although, that, as Mert again says, that it is fell under the state for liability. But if we were to take something up to Europa or to Mars, which we have done, or crash something into Mars, the astrobiology sign of it is that we are compromising the atmosphere um, we are potentially taking spores or cells or bacteria into the various different atmospheres that we wouldn't have in the first in the first instance. Now, the issue being that well, why is that important? Well, first of all, humanity does not really have an inherent right to take something up to a different planet and to kill black bacteria, or to stop the science uh, to find out what the origin origins of life is. Now. We, we can sort of take comfort in that there is sort of um, laws governing um, in international. So as Thomas rightly said, the Antarctic Treaty, we have the high seas um, and some parts of UNCLOS, which are in some respects areas of non-jurisdiction. However, they weren't written for space, they weren't written for Mars and nothing is. If we consider the Outer Space Treaty and the five the five of the, the four of the treaties sorry to be an evolutionary process um, and it does seem that to be um, when it's been written there is not really a lot of definition and especially in article 9 of the Outer space treaty there is not really definitions to say we can't do this we can't do that it very much focuses on earth um, without forward contamination and it only has been that forward contamination is a real aspect and into what can we do and how do we take stuff up there? Science has pretty much said that the surface of Mars now is polluted um, and that we will have um, positive signs that we are taking stuff up there. So the, the ethical consideration that where do we go from there? Mars is already an active planet in the, in the sense that we are carrying scientific missions out. Now we are starting to drill down to the subsurface of Mars. Now the subsurface of Mars hasn't been touched. So this is where science can find the origins of life, the origins of how Mars was. It could find nothing, but that, that's what we need to protect. And that's where planetary protection and COSPAR comes in. COSPAR itself has five different categories. Um, and in comparison, the NASA 2019 study um, really confirms these planetary protection guidelines, but also has some different voices on how private industry could actually go around by investigating. What we have to think about is that science, technology, geopolitics, and private entities are all there for different things. Private entity would like to make money mining the moon, mining the area of asteroids, but also making colonies on Mars. And science 
although would like to see more scientific on Mars, it's hard to get there. So they would like to have special regions, polar regions. They would like to go to the, the likes of Enceladus, Icy Moons, Phobos, um, and Europa to, to try and find them origins of life before really humanity gets, gets there. Waste the opportunity by building structures, by even living on there and creating an atmosphere that we don't have. So the, the, real, the, the realistic approach that space governance is important, we must consider this, we must consider the foundations that we already have on Earth by applying earthly international and domestic law into trying to make something, of us, as something that is space governance. But also using what we have in science, in COSPA and in international declarations that aren't legally binding into trying progressing into the outer solar system and the solar system beyond geosynchronic orbit and lower Earth orbit to actually progress humanity so that we can find, use, adapt and explore everything to do with space. There is, and, and I, I always like to start this, that the people who watch Star Trek are, are perfectly aware, and I, I've never really watched Star Trek, but the prime directive to observe and not to interfere should be the first premise of absolutely everything that we do in space. So observe, to watch, to investigate at a distance, to make sure that we aren't com committing genocide of another planet. That may be in, in the early foundations and the early start of, human, of, of, of bacterial or virus or anything to do with that planet. And we must consider that before we do so. And unfortunately, we haven't done that with Mars. We haven't done that with a lot of different planets and near Earth objects. And we really need to enhance space governance through the use of cooperation through all of the sectors. Yes, to make money, because without money, space will not get touched. Without money, without financial gain through private entities, science won't exist. Governance and governments will not fund a scientific mission if it doesn't yield anything, or if the potential that, yes, okay, we can mine this in the future. Um, so really, the, the, the whole stem of space governance is an interesting idea to start with but it needs to be helped and it needs it can't just be lawyers it can't just be scientists it can't be private industries it can't be governance governments and especially it can't under be, two minutes left sorry it can't be just done by one person it has to be a multi-sectoral part of it and whether that is through space agencies whether that's through individual states or whether that's just through the, the already in, in, in international instruments that we have, I, the International Telecommunication Union, or COSPA that gets together and opens up a whole new remit. And that's where it's really exciting because space governance, astrobiology, COSPA and planetary protection has all been discussed individually, um, sometimes together, but not all together. And that's my project that I'm currently studying. Um, and hopefully I'll get some answers in the future. I thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all our panelists there for giving very uh, uh, interesting perspectives um, uh, on you know, their aspects and their research on space. And uh, um, well, it's a terrible pun, but this is a very big space. Uh, there's a lot of different um, avenues and lenses that we can apply to any number of problems uh, and issues in space. And um, now, I think that there are two ways to submit questions. One is is to uh, write it up in the chat bar or to use the raise hand function. This is my first time chairing one of these sessions, so uh, please um, uh, forgive me if I don't see all questions or all hands um, or don't select everything for amount of time. Um, but uh, whilst I try and sort out some of the questions and start picking them, uh, I guess I'll just uh, start off uh, to get the panel's response to, I guess, from, from the more IR uh, background, uh, given that this is BISA and also my own um, uh, approach when I teach this uh, to my own students about, you know, space governance and, and trying to resolve problems in space and how can states 
predominantly address them is that um, are we are we you know likely to see basically a rerun on a lot of sustainability issues in space as to what we're seeing on earth especially when you know are the parallels to be made that are justifiable with climate change especially with the debris issue and uh, radio frequency spectrum where when there's a real finite resource um, the geopolitical um, horse trading happens in a few select international institutions so that the big powers get what they want and everybody else more or less has to like it. Um, and uh, there's a real tragedy of the commons or um, uh, the stag hunt um, analogy in, in play here. I mean, and, and the tragedy of the commons, the stag hunt are two sort of primary analogies in international relations when dealing with climate or environment politics. Do you think that they are useful, are they accurate, um, and are they even prophetic uh, towards how we may or may not end up dealing with a lot of the environmental and resource allocation and sharing problems in space? Um, does anyone on the panel want to have a stab at that? I can, I can take it for you. So game theory, I was just thinking of that. Um, game theory does come up especially when we're talking about whether we should collaborate versus uh, cooperate, which are two kind of fine differences. The, the issue I see with ga using game theory to especially address, let's say, space debris, is that from the readings that I have, game theory is very good in, in theory, but in practicality, it's very hard to, to assess because when these things like stag hunt and prisoner dilemma were put together, it was for a small pool or a small in group of um, actors, whereas in space we have a large number, so it might be a little bit harder to play that game. However, I do see that this idea of pollution and that we have to have a collective active approach to, to safeguarding from the space debris is something that could be drawn from the environmental perspective or like you mentioned, the climate change regime and I think that's where we're starting to see our own outer space regime uh, is evolving because we're looking at something like we have now the long-term sustainability guidelines or the space debris mitigation guidelines and we're saying okay you don't have to do this but we encourage you to do this because as it stands we all know that the major players Russia, China, the US have the majority of the debris. However you can't prove that and they aren't willing to spend the money to clean all of it, or how would they do it without creating some kind of security, harmful interference threat like I spoke of before. That's where I think something like what Harriet's doing is helping because you've got companies coming in trying to find ways to help that don't seem as aggressive as a state doing it. And so there's a, there's a way to kind of we're, learn from our mistakes on earth as to what we can do in space. However, I have to caution, space is its own unique environment. And in environmental um, regimes, they usually use the word local understanding, where you can go and see where the pollution is and you can get a, a reading and, a, and actually visually be there. Well, we can't, we, we have the satellites, the machines up there. So our local understanding of the debris issue is slightly different than our local understanding of it in say the, the plastic in the ocean, or if you have um, pollution from oil spills or something like this. So maybe Harriet, you can take up on how we might be able to help um, from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely, Lauren. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting question and, and it's something that we've actually started looking at very recently. So we've, we've just started a collaboration with the University of Northumbria actually looking at decommissioning and end of life practices in other industries and how they can relate to or be applied to the satellite industry. So I think one thing that Lauren's just touched on which is really important is one, this these kinds of environmental problems that we're facing in space are not necessarily new, but the arena is new in terms of how they're being applied. Um, and the second is, you know, there are industries on Earth that we can learn something from in terms of those regulations, frameworks uh, and models for, for solving these problems. So a kind of a couple of specific examples of that, uh, looking at the oil and gas sector. So looking at how um, oil rigs are decommissioned. Um, firstly, if you want to build an oil rig in the sea, 
you need to make sure that you have a decommissioning plan in place from the get-go so that you can return the environment to its natural state, right? Um, in the uh, nuclear industry, if you're looking at building a nuclear power plant, again, you need to have segregated funds set aside in order to uh, pay for decommissioning at the end of life. And so there's a number of different instances in, in other industries where we see these frameworks existing. Um, but I think what, something that Lauren pointed out, which is really critical, is, is space is different. And so it's really important to understand what the similarities and differences are between industries on Earth and the environment that we have in space. Because there's not going to be a perfect analogy for something that we've seen before. But I think we do have an opportunity uh, in space to kind of learn from these other industries. And instead of waiting for that catastrophic collision or that, you know, that disaster event that really kicks us into action, uh, maybe we can be more proactive than other industries have been able to be um, and start this conversation a little bit sooner. Uh, yes, Tom. I think uh, part of what we'll, we'll see with um, space is that the polluters are actually affected by their own pollution which is something we don't see within necessarily see with industries on earth uh, um, if through the proliferation of space debris we render earth orbit unusable um, then the space industry is sort of done and so i think there's that economic incentive to fix this problem um, which we don't necessarily have with, with polluting industries on earth Okay, um, unless so, two other panelists are going to jump in immediately. I'll I'll um, I'll move on. Um, okay, so um, uh, there's a question here from uh, Scott. Um, uh, sorry, for Scott. Sorry, from somebody called 2016. Um, do you have anything to back your statement? The government will not fund space missions unless they can make money. But I, I think we can sort of um, take a larger question from that and, and look at you know, the role of perhaps public sector government funding um, in um, funding large exploration missions. Uh, and that not just uh, regulating the missions, but also in terms of um, cleaning up the mess that uh, um, you know a lot of different countries have been making in space, but also private sectors as well. What is the role of public funding in uh, resolving um, uh, these problems, as well as funding any large new missions or technologies? Uh, does anyone want to kick us off in responding to that? I, th I think just um, from from that point of view, the assertion is, um, and, and again, Vlad, you've just pretty much hit it is. To, Sorry to, to preempt you. No, no, it's 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 to what public funding is, um, and to what public funding is to be used for, and and especially today, um, COVID nineteen is getting billions upon trillions spent on. So why do we send another rover that is publicly funded to Mars to do the same thing as that the rover is now? And that was, um, that for example, in twenty twenty, the, the um, European Space Agency were meant to send um, another rover up to Mars, but didn't. Um, the the real answer is that do we continue to fund science without getting anything back? And all private industries, including at some point um, gov governments, will be saying, well, we are funding this from billions upon billions upon billions, but unfortunately we are not getting anything back. And it, it, it stands to reason to logic over history to geopolitics that unless some financial gain is happening or some scientific gain that will help earth or help health or will help something that it's not feasible to carry on spending money excellent um okay thank you um so uh i guess i think in the interest of time because we're fast getting to half past three um i'll take the next two questions uh from the raised hand uh function so uh we got um anurada i think and uh hassan so um anurada are you able to speak to us to ask a question and then once you're done if we can have hassan jump in to ask a question and then we'll have the panel respond to both thank you Sure, thank you, Bethan, and thank you, everyone. It's such an interesting panel. Um, I've really enjoyed particularly hearing things to do with soft law um, and moving forward in regulation in space. So I'm from Vertic. In particular, we're interested in space traffic management at the moment, um, specifically from a verification, monitoring, and national implementation lens. So what I'm particularly interested in hearing about from this panel, given the sort of IR um, and great power 
conversation that could be had is about data ownership from space situational awareness technology so given the tensions between states that we can't ignore yeah, yeah there is always the context of that um, what do you think could be done for confidence building between states to ensure that any database is built for a hypothetical space traffic management set of regulations or soft laws um, could be you know trustworthy or democratized within states because obviously there are those states which which do have uh, more advanced SSA technology, most advanced SSA technology I think is commercial, but they obviously belong within states. So yeah, that, that's what I'm interested in today. Thank you though. Thanks. Uh, Hassan? Great, thank you. Thank you very much for all the panelists and for Visa for putting this together. Um, um, it means space panels are usually fun because they are one heavy and, and I think this one is is no exception so thank you for for that my question is on space diplomacy and I've been following some of the discussion taking place in the UN um, specifically in the General Assembly and First Committee um, this year which was pretty decisive when it came to to space um, my question is actually broader on the sort of the, the updated draft treaty that was submitted by China and Russia, and I believe that was in 2008. And I wonder what the panel thinks about um, the way Russia and China are, are seeing eye to eye on, on space issue, issues. Is it basically a reflection of sort of like broader geopolitics or, or are there some common sort of like space issues that allows them to see um, eye to eye on these issues to the extent of submitting a, a joint and common draft. Um, and aside from their draft, I mean, what are your views on a possible possible treaty? Obviously, the it's uh, it's the draft is is heavily contested in the UN. But apart from that very specific draft, what are the chances of getting a draft to work? Thank you. Um, leave it open to the panel. Any uh, responses? Could I jump in? Did I put my hand up? How do we do it? Just yeah, yeah. crack on that. Um, I thought they were both brilliant questions, actually. I mean, thanks for giving your time to listen to us. Um, but I think I'm going to tackle Hassan's question first because I really like the question of treaty questions. Um, I think, not to be blunt, but I don't. Th I, I think the answer to the will there be any further treaties is probably no. I, I don't think at this point that it would be right or possible to have further treaties because. Um, I mean, the treaties really took off when there were less actors involved and it was less of a broad scope as well. So it wasn't so much commercial, individual, academic. It was more militaristic in two powers and then the other countries which sort of took sides. So it was mo mostly multiple voices funneled through two views, you know, sort of the a de dem dem democracy and communism lens almost. Uh, and now there's far too many different views to be able to do a sort of a, a fit all lens, so to speak, of a treaty. I think that, I mean, as mentioned earlier, uh, it'll probably be uh, be more like to be soft long guidelines that start ruling space law as well as sort of these small like bilateral agreements and sort of decisions and practice that starts to pave the way instead. Um, but no, I, I do think it's, it's a very good question. And I do think it was, I mean, these interesting sort of code of conducts and treaties have popped up. There was some between Europe and the US. There was some between Russia and China. I think there's things to be said about potential ideological agreements as well as potential um, sometimes enemy of my enemy of my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But then again, the, I mean, the big three in the space industry, as we know, US, China, and Russia disagree, in, disagree on a lot of things, but agree on things as well. They just refuse to agree together. But that's a whole different discussion for another day. And I'd like to give, rather than nattering on, give everybody else a chance to answer it. So thanks for the questions, guys. Anyone else? Um, I'll take the first one because actually there were a few years ago, there was through the group of governmental experts, what they call a GGE report on transparency and confidence building measures. And while you don't hear much about that anymore, that's another one of our non-legally binding documents that we look at, but you do now see it also included in the long-term sustainability guidelines. And just a little Side note, all of these are on the UN website for free and you can get them in the five official languages if you want to take a deep dive. Um, so when we talk about transparency and confidence building measures, it's basically saying under that framework of space traffic management and space situational awareness, space domain awareness, space, there's many different forms of the same thing. It's all different 
um, terminology by different uh, states. What they do come together and say is we do need to be aware of tracking the debris. We need to be aware of what's there and, and why it's there, which is why, as Mert pointed out, we have the registration convention. However, even with the registration convention where you're supposed to uh, register your space object and then do the same through the ITU for radio regulations, sometimes it happens after it's already gone to space. So we're not getting an accurate picture of what's up there at the right time. Um, what, I, what I see about space chart management is that through transparency and through multilateral collaboration, uh, we will be able to find a way forward where we can use this as a, as a way to kind of keep track of each other and maybe verify what is there, but in a more passive, less aggressive way, if that makes sense. The United States does have a multilateral agreement on space situational awareness with UK, for example, Canada, Australia, etc. But most of them are Western, uh, like-minded English-speaking countries. I think France and Germany are also a part of that. And so they are able to share that data and share that awareness. However, you still see the other two large players kind of off to the side. What I can mention though, from a political point of, point of view is if there were to be any harmful interference with the US, Russia and China sitting permanently on the Security Council, you can give them sanctions, but it's very hard to get them to uh, change their ways because they kind of have a, a permanent way to kind of make a statement. And so now we are at the point where for this to work, we need to continue our collaboration efforts and work more jointly to make this something about sustainability and not just security, which is why I think the 3S approach to space traffic management makes it less militaristic and less about whether or not we're considering what we're doing a weapon, but actually a, a pollution cleanup um, agenda. I just want to quickly add to what Lauren was saying with a specific example. Um, uh, over the last year, uh, the Northrop Grumman, which is a commercial U US company, launched a life extension mission to service a satellite in geostationary orbit. Uh, it was called the MEV-1 mission, Mission Extension Vehicle 1. Um, and over the last year, there was a uh, international collaborative effort called Phantom Echoes to provide uh, space surveillance, essentially, of that mission. And it was uh, led by the UK, by DSTL, which I can't remember what that acronym means off the top of my head, but it's a defense research organization, uh, together with uh, the countries that make up the Five Eyes, to uh, essentially use it as a, an example uh, trial run to share data between the, these five countries and their, uh, their space situational and awareness tracking capabilities. Um, some of the, the information and outputs of, of that initiative have been made public, um, but it's a really interesting example of, of seeing different nations come together and, and share space situational and awareness information um, with the potential for future collaboration with commercial operators as well. So they are looking at doing a follow up of that for the second um, uh, life extension mission that Northrop Grumman are, are planning to, to launch in the near future. Uh, but that's a, a very specific and, and quantifiable example of this kind of collaboration working in practice right now. And then just to finish on a point on transparency and the, and the democratization of um, space situational awareness, um, I, I think it's, it is more of a political uh, and psychological problem rather than a technical one. Um, TJ Kelso, the CEO of um, uh, Celeste Track, said a couple of months ago that um, if you're an American company and you're doing um, space tracking on a commercial basis, um, as soon as you start getting information about classified American satellites, that's like um, you know standing on the third row. Rail uh, of of a, of a railway line, you know, you, you just it shuts down your operations. You get electrified, and I'm not in a good way um, because the U.S. military establishment then just stops you from sharing that data because it is classified information and it is sharing information that is uh, potentially sharing information that is too sensitive. Um, and the reality is for the United States is that. 
other countries are able to de uh, develop those technologies now they are doing so more and more countries are investing more and more in SSA technologies as well um, amateur observers are doing an amazing job as well you just follow certain people on Twitter you've got a better idea of half the White House on where things are in space uh, unless they get a specific briefing from the relevant agencies in the US government on it so um, so I, I think that's a psychological problem a sort of a security hypochondria that uh, the American military and uh, intelligence establishment has to get over so on an optimistic ground I don't think there's uh, technical hurdles towards sh you know SSA sharing it is more political but that is perhaps more in intractable in intractable um, so we're, we're running out of time very quickly um, so I guess there's a quick clarification answer and, I, and I'd like to hear this clarification as well uh, from um, Andrew uh, Swackhammer if I'm saying that correctly to Mert um, and, and that's on um, in the liability case who does um, uh, a space actor, whether it's an agency or a company, actually go to? Because as far as I understand, there is no international actual body. So is it a government to government thing in settling that dispute that happens? Can, can you clarify that for us, Mert? Right. Well, um, you're all lucky that I wrote part of my dissertation on this, so I'm legally allowed to bore you right now. Um, the, now the, the complexity of the liability convention is part partly in its ambiguity and partly in that it's kind of useless sorry to say um the specifications of the liability convention are that it provides a certain set of rules throughout the articles towards the end i didn't go too in depth to it because i don't want to lose the audience and um i also you know 10 minutes but uh, essentially it provides a list of rules for both governments to follow. For example, let's take the Cosmos Iridium because that's why I modeled my answer on um, a year ago. It was the Russian, uh, Russian military uh, satellite and US commercial. So it would have been the, the uh, actors would later recompense, recompensate the uh, governments, but the governments would take it through first. So the Russian government, the US government, would follow the guidelines of the uh, Liberty Convention to sort of set um, their own arbitration almost. It's like a, their own form of alternative dispute resolution where they would sit down along with the rules, pick an arbitrator or pick some like independent body, agree upon certain terms, and then carry out their negotiation or their deal on how it be, how it be formed. There's also sort of fail safes for if um, these things don't work out or, you know, surprise, surprise, governments don't get along, they, they can um, opt for time extensions for documents or for hearing dates or for whatever, as well as the UN to appoint bodies and to appoint sort of agreed um, uh, <coughs> experts and forth. So it's essentially, it, it creates like a, a civil court in a sense. But again, my memory on this is quite hazy. So I mean, I would like to refresh it before I tell you all, but this is essentially what it really is. In terms of whether there should be an independent body, um, I think that at the moment, and this is something that my project quite touches on, so I'm really glad you, you asked the question actually, because my project at Space Law Games is trying to create a litigative toolkit and trying to answer these questions. I don't think at the time currently that the um, world is ready for an independent court or an independent organization apart from the UN to run these things. I think it will be a case of gently gently catchy monkey i think people are going to work together and start building up that sort of uh <clears throat> cooperation that's what my project's aiming for as well actually because um governments getting along and citizens being getting along are two different things a government rules over citizens were sort of like that i mean the government's the first among equals with its citizens whereas governments you can't treat them like citizens so even in the un they all stand in their own their own position basically it's not like while they are equal we can't treat my citizens, so a court is much more difficult to implement. But I, I think in a utopian world, yes, it would be brilliant to have an independent organization that did all of it. But I think getting there will take some time. Uh, thanks very much. Um, can you uh, jump in quickly, Tom, so that I can squeeze in another question? I just think it's important to highlight that under the space treaties, ultimately states are responsible. Um, and that's why and so in the UK, you indemnify the UK government uh, against insurance claims. So if you have a problem, speak to your government. 
excellent. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think we've got time for one last question. I apologise I've not been able to take everyone's questions. Um, but I think um, this question here comes back to one of the larger sort of recurring themes of this panel, and that is space traffic management, really. Um, and the role of the military is unavoidable, and uh, the military has been something that hasn't really been spoken much about in this panel. Uh, it's not a criticism, just an observation. Um, but uh, I, I believe if what the panel thinks here, and this is a question from Joel, is what is the military's role do you see either as or should be um, in uh, managing sustainability of the space? And I'd broaden that out to any space traffic management regime as well. What role do you see for the military? Um, and remember, we're running up on time here. Yeah, Tom? I think that, um, at least in rhetoric, this is on one where the US does get it right, that the role of the military should be ensuring that sustainability and the, the usability of outer space. Um, you can sort of envision it as a kind of an equivalent to like the freedom of operations uh, at sea. Um, but how that works is we can debate, but I think that's their, should be their role. And Russ, any, any uh, thoughts on um, what the military's role should be in any space traffic management regime? Uh, Lauren. So, like, connected with space situational awareness, I mean, the US government and, by extension, military is already doing a great job by tracking objects. And that's where I was talking about where they're working together with other countries. However, I do know from the US perspective, they're also looking to try to take the pressure off the military, actually, and make it a bit more commercial because space situational awareness, space traffic management, it's very tedious and it takes very, it's just like flying, imagine flying the plane. The operator of that, the pilot has to be aware of the plane itself, everything on it, what's going on in the environment around it, what is the wind doing, what is, is there a storm, where are the other planes? There are a lot of things that you have to consider, which means there's a lot of training that has to be done. And I know that um, as we're moving and changing things, that's something where perhaps the military and commercial can work together to find the best qualified people to operate and make decisions. Because you then have issues where if you make the wrong decision and you, and you mess up the plan or you don't actually make the trajectory correct in your observations, then we've got a collision and a litigation on our hands. So it's, it's more about, it's less about whether it should be military versus commercial, in my opinion, and more about the right people that are trained to understand how to assess something that we aren't doing ourselves that are actually happening by, by satellites that are not being operated on by everyone on the ground. Excellent, thanks very much. All right, we are at um, 3.30 on the dot here, um, and I, I think um, uh, Juliet is, is uh, back on. Do you have some closing uh, remarks for us, Juliet? Uh, oh, only to thank you very much, uh, Abledon, and all, all the panellists, thank you so much. Um, I also note that uh, Hassan is with us, who is a BISA board member. It's always nice to, to get the support. Um, so thank you all. I know absolutely nothing about this subject, so for me, um, you know, it's, I've, I've learned quite a thing. So uh, thank, thank you all very much.